The dress must cost a fortune, Veronica's best friend, the witness, said with hidden envy. She watched as the makeup artist added the finishing touches and imagined herself as the bride. It must be said, she liked it. When you get married for love and walk down the aisle in a cotton robe, Christina thought sadly. But alas, it had nothing to do with her. If it were up to the bride, she would run away from here far, far away, beyond seven mountains, or even further, to a place where she wouldn't have to marry a wealthy but unloved Nicholas. Unfortunately, Christina couldn't do that. Her father was seriously ill and needed money for surgery. Big money, which a modest librarian, raised in a poor family, had nowhere to get. They didn't have wealthy relatives, so, as often happens, the daughter was forced to agree to a lucrative marriage. She simply didn't see any other way out. Oh, come on, don't be down, Veronica tried to cheer her up. It's not us, it's life. Well, we weren't born into the Rockefeller family, so we fill that annoying gap as best we can. If only it were just that, sighed the bride. Today Thomas appeared in my dream and I feel like something's going to happen. It's just nerves, her friend replied. Pre-wedding jitters. No, it's not, Christina shook her head. Thomas. Well, maybe it's just nonsense. Christina, Thomas is no longer with us, her friend said quietly. But you are. And Nicholas is. And everyone knows he's been pining for you for ages. You'll be like butter in his hands. My aunt always says you should stick with the guys who love you and let them love you. Christina was already on edge, and now her friend with her advice. She said everything, she was curious. And now please, just be quiet. Well, okay, Veronica pouted. I do wish you well. Just wish it for yourself, okay? Don't touch Thomas, cut off Christina. But what's the point of arguing on such a day? So she hurried to add. Veronica, I understand you wish me well, but there are things that. Well, things. Suddenly a nasty lump formed in her throat, and the bride couldn't speak anymore. However, Veronica understood that she had also gone too far and said, I'm sorry, without thinking. Peace? Well, of course, Christina smiled. Thomas, her former fiancé, died just over a year ago. He was a mountaineer and fell off a cliff during an expedition. They searched for the guy for a long time, and when they found him, there was nothing they could do to help him. One of the members of the mountaineering group suggested that the rope could have been cut. Who would do that, argued another. Thomas had no enemies. What is true is true. Thomas was remarkably peaceful and completely non-conflictual. I can't even imagine who he could have crossed paths with. It wouldn't hurt a fly. And the rope could simply have worn out. But since the first employee assured that Thomas was very meticulous about his equipment, the investigation did not ignore the version of the deliberately cut rope. When Thomas's colleague said he had no enemies, he wasn't entirely right. However, how could he know that Thomas and Nicholas, that is, Christina's current fiancé, had been enemies since school? However, Nicholas was not liked at school at all, but still. If time changed their relationship, it only changed for the worse. School enmity turned into real hatred, and already being adults, Thomas and Nicholas became sworn enemies. Thomas graduated from college, got a job in a mountaineering group, and after working there for six months, he proposed to Christina. She gladly accepted, and a couple of days later, they announced a commercial expedition at work. Christina really didn't want to let her fiancé go, she had a bad feeling about it. Christina, what's wrong? Thomas asked with a smile. Work is work, and you know it's no worse than mine. Yes, I know, she sighed, but I can't help it. Oh, stop it, the head-over-heels-in-love guy waved his hand carelessly. Everything will be fine. I'll go on the expedition, earn some money, and we'll start preparing for the wedding. All friends and relatives of the young couple never ceased to sincerely rejoice for them. They were already looking forward to the joyful wedding of this beautiful pair, but the terrible news of Thomas's death dashed all hopes. After the funeral, Christina went to the cemetery every day and mourned the deceased fiancé in solitude. It was easier for her to bear the bitterness of loss this way. 
My beloved, my good one, she whispered with her lips, no one will ever take your place in my heart. But misfortune never comes alone. Mr. Felix, Christina's father, fell seriously ill. Initially, he was misdiagnosed. After some time, it was corrected. But by then, precious time had been lost. Only surgery can help you, said his treating doctor, Mr. Andrew. Well, surgery is surgery, sighed the father. I need to sign up. Not only that, the doctor replied, somewhat embarrassed. The surgery, in your case, is not free. And what's the price? Mr. Felix inquired. Mr. Andrew clicked his calculator, then promptly showed the patient the screen. I see, he said resignedly. Christina's father worked as an electrician, and such a sum could only be dreamed of. I'll find the money, Dad, Christina said. Where will you get them, her father chuckled sadly. If necessary, I'll rob a bank, his daughter replied decisively. The next day, Christina did indeed go to the bank. Of course, she didn't intend to rob it, but why not try to apply for a loan? Unfortunately, you're denied, said the young man in the crisply ironed white shirt. But why? I. Banks don't give out such statements, the credit specialist shook his head. But maybe there's a way to increase the likelihood of approval? Of course there is, the guy smiled broadly. You just need to find a higher paying job or marry a wealthy man. I can't advise anything else. Besides, it's not within my duties. Goodbye. Christina walked sadly to the bus stop, contemplating whether to try another bank. Tears blurred her vision. This is medicine for you. If you have money, treat yourself to your heart's content. Any whim for your cash. And if you don't? You might as well lie down and die. She could ponder this for as long as she wanted, but there was no use. Hey, beauty, she heard a male voice as she passed by the business center parking lot. Nicholas. Lord, the last thing she needed for complete happiness was him. He owned a hotel, and as far as she remembered, rented an office there. Oh, hi, Christina replied wearily. Went to the bank? Nicholas inquired. Are you following me? I just had to, her former classmate grinned. There seems to be only one road along this alley, to the bank. And how did it go? The girl sighed heavily. I see, Nicholas nodded. Need a ride? Christina wanted to refuse. She knew she was liked by Nicholas and not just by him. So she really didn't want anyone to see her with an old admirer. What else would they say? She hadn't even buried her fiancé yet, and she's already riding in a car with another man. However, Nicholas was insistent, and Christina was too tired. Besides, she wanted to get home as quickly as possible. One downside, the attempt to apply for a loan had failed. How's your father? Nicholas asked sympathetically. Christina sighed again. I understand that you need money for treatment? For surgery, she replied. I see. Kristen. Yes? I've been thinking about you all the time. Nicholas, you understand. I understand, he nodded. And I also understand that there's nowhere to get money for your father's surgery. I'll try another bank. If one rejected me, it doesn't mean another will. I never thought you were so naive. He shook his head. That's exactly what it means. Another attempt in such a short time. Almost a hundred percent rejection. Don't believe me? Ask any bank employee. Kristen, I could have helped you. Thank you. I'll manage without your help. Well, don't get upset. It's just not smart, honestly. As it turned out, Christina, who had recently lost her fiancé, accepted Nicholas's courtship. As often happens in a small town, the girl gave local gossip something to talk about, and quite a bit. The upcoming wedding of a successful businessman and an unremarkable, except for being very beautiful, librarian became one of the most discussed events. She caught herself a rich one, some said. But this mountaineer loved her so much. And it hadn't even been six months since the funeral. 
No, Christina wouldn't do that, others objected. She's doing it for her sick father. Or maybe he took advantage of the situation. In general, as many people, as many opinions. Well, those opinions interested Christina least of all. The main thing was to operate on her father. Some particularly curious citizens bothered to come to the registry office just to gawk at the newlyweds, and this was at the end of February. A splendid snow-white procession of ten cars, led by a limousine, pulled up to the registry office. Nicholas, a true gentleman, helped the bride out of the car, and they headed into the registry office. James, finally, the presenter clapped her hands. We're late, we're late. You're not alone for a moment. Wait, what James? Nicholas frowned. We're Bennett, well, at least I am for now, but... Yes, but you're for James, said the registry office employee. Your time is 12.15. That's some mistake. No mistake, she shook her head. Here, look. Well, they really mixed up the time, the groom said astonishingly. Well, let's wait. Right, darling? Christina was only too happy. Despite the fact that marriage to a man who was not dear to her heart was inevitable, the bride was even glad for this small delay. You can't catch your breath before death, of course, but still. A crowd of onlookers blocked the observation post near the squad of stokers, working in the old-fashioned way with coal. Suddenly, the door of one of them swung open with a noise, and a fairly young man covered in soot emerged from it. The crowd froze in anticipation of something unusual, and, it must be said, they were not disappointed. When Mr. Andrew saw the dazzling white cars, he immediately understood that the future spouse's Bennett had arrived. He silently watched the procession from the window of the stokers, where he worked, and when he saw the bride, he gritted his teeth to the point of pain. Waiting until Nicholas and Christina entered the registry office, he approached the car and with a finger dirty with soot, he wrote one single word on it. Nicholas and Christina came out onto the street. Dear guests, the groom said theatrically, there has been a slight hiccup. You see, we mixed up the time, so we'll have to wait. The guests laughed. Well, well, one of the business partners chuckled. Mr. Nicholas was in such a hurry to marry this charming lady that he confused the time of the wedding ceremony. Christina shuddered. She thought to herself, strangers. The words seemed mocking to her, and overall, Kristen felt terribly uncomfortable among these people, the cream of society, as it were. Absolutely right, Nicholas said smugly, embracing his bride. Nicholas, can I go to the car, she whispered. I'm freezing. And it was true. The fur coat worn over the thin silk dress was purely decorative and couldn't provide any warmth. Well, of course you can, he replied condescendingly, as if talking to a child. And that's when he finally got on Kristen's nerves, but it was only the beginning. When they approached the limousine, they saw the word, Thomas, written in large letters on the hood. Kristen felt uneasy. The four letters, painted in either paint or soot on the snowy white background of the limousine, looked absurd and sinister at the same time. Kristen's face turned pale, practically indistinguishable from her wedding dress. She looked at her groom and suddenly remembered that they hadn't particularly liked each other in school, and afterward either. But from Nicholas's expression, it was clear, he was just as stunned as his bride. However, that changed nothing. Realizing that she had almost made a terrible mistake, Kristen silently threw the bridal bouquet in Nicholas's face and, lifting the hem of her dress, ran away. Where to? Anywhere. Nicholas's first thought was to catch her, but the clumsy groom had a timely realization. Kristen embarrassed him in front of the guests, but chasing after the runaway bride would only worsen his already unenviable situation. Oh, let her run, he thought, how far will she get anyway? And Kristen ran and heard. What happened? What's the matter? Who does she think she is? The guests were, to put it mildly, astonished by the bride's violent reaction. And her flight from her own wedding was seen as disrespect, not only to her husband, but to everyone present. This is how one businesswoman, who was present at the ruined wedding, highfalutinly expressed it. Onlookers, pleased that they hadn't come in vain, all took out their smartphones and hurried to capture the dramatic scene with the subsequent escape. 
The bride's relatives, realizing that they had nothing to do there, went home. Anne Nicholas, slightly calmed down, approached the driver and shouted, Where were you looking, idiot? The driver just shrugged helplessly. I only stepped away for a couple of minutes to have a smoke, he explained. I came back, and then this, the writing and the traces. Well, I didn't do anything and decided to wait for you. Understood, Nicholas replied. What kind of jerk could have written this, he thought, but he never got around to it. Kristen walked through the city, tangled in her wedding dress, tears streaming down her cheeks. The phone was straining in the miniature pearl purse, but she seemed to hear nothing. Passersby curiously watched the runaway bride, but Kristen paid no attention to them. In her mind, she had the thought that her late fiancé had come from the afterlife, just like living people. Kristen understood logically that it wasn't possible. But the problem was that this detail of her body wasn't functioning properly at the moment. Thomas didn't like that she was going to marry his archenemy. So he made himself known, she thought. Kristen turned onto the street where she lived and suddenly felt her heel break. She took off her shoes and threw them angrily into the nearest trash can. Her feet were painfully freezing, but it became easier to walk. She only had one stop left until home. Seeing a taxi, she ran up to the car and asked hopefully. Are you free? Yeah, I'm free, the fifty-something man replied, looking at her warily. He probably mistook her for a woman of easy virtue or something like that. And do you have money? I'll find it, Kristen nervously replied. Are you sure you'll find it, he asked skeptically. Sure, sure. Well, let's go. She gave the address, and the taxi driver grumbled. Not too far to go. In the car, she possibly remarked with a hysterical smirk. My feet are frozen solid. I threw my shoes in the trash. Did you run away from the wedding? The driver asked. The old man understood everything correctly. So, he didn't take kindly to women of loose morals. However, it was unclear what he would do. What if he decided to take her and deliver her quickly to Nicholas, like a package? Get in, sign here. How do you know? Kristen asked fearfully. What's so hard to understand, he chuckled, as if he only ever transported runaway brides. Or is your wedding dress your everyday attire? And if it is, so what, the would-be businessman's spouse challenged. Nothing, shrugged the taxi driver. Just looking at you girls, and I can't figure out what you want from life. Is the groom at least rich? We've arrived, Kristen stated, ignoring the driver's questions. Fortunately, somehow there was money in her purse. And miraculously, there was enough, or else she'd have to go back down. Christina, exclaimed Agatha, embracing her daughter. We didn't know what to think. My goodness, you're barefoot. Where are your shoes? Does it matter? Kristen shouted. Does it really matter? Thomas came to me from the afterlife to express his protest, and you're asking about some shoes. Shoes. Kristen, what's wrong with you? Her mother asked. We saw you throw the bouquet in Nicholas's face and run away. What's going on? We still don't understand. I'm telling you, Thomas came to me from the afterlife, what's so hard to understand, the fugitive shouted. Kristen's nerves were at breaking point. She couldn't stop herself anymore. Leave her alone, came Frederick's voice from the bedroom. Agatha, can't you see she's not herself? Her father's voice reminded Kristen that she hadn't been able to help him with the operation. Poor dad, the girl sobbed. Here, dear, her mother said quietly, hugging her and thereby preventing a new outburst of hysteria. Have some mint tea and get some rest. You'll feel better right away. Let's go, I'll make up the bed for you. Her mother hugged her around the waist and led her to the bedroom. Kristen obediently, as if in childhood, complied. In childhood? How nice it was there. Mom would comfort and soothe, and the world seemed less hostile. Why wasn't everything like that in adult life? Meanwhile, Nicholas was trying to find the one who ruined his wedding. Fortunately, in the age of digital technology, it wasn't such an insurmountable task. 
thanks to a dashboard camera in one of the cars, he managed to get a lead. Well, buddy, what can you tell me, the businessman said quietly. Whose idiotic idea wrecked all my dreams? Nicholas saw a young man emerge from one of the fireboxes, dressed in dirty clothes, looking like a tramp. Obviously, he worked there. Yeah, buddy, you don't even know who you're messing with, Nicholas muttered quietly. I'll find you, and you won't get away with it. Oh, you won't get away with it. Unaware of the threat looming over him, Mr. Andrew stoked the coals in the stove and decided to have a cup of tea. I'll try to visit that girl tomorrow, he decided. Luckily, he had her address. And even if this Kristen no longer lived there, her parents could be there. Either way, the address written on the envelope was his only clue. The young fireman nibbled on a piece of gingerbread, washed it down with aromatic drink, and deeply pondered. Andrew's lot turned out to be unenviable. Released from the orphanage, he already had a secondary education. He obtained state housing, got a job at a factory as a turner, and then was called up to the army. Well, Andrew didn't intend to shirk his duty to his country, and he had no respect for those who did. After serving two years in the airborne forces, he returned home and, without procrastinating, went to work at the factory. Kid, are you out of your mind, smirked the guard. The factory closed a year ago. Now they're setting up a car showroom here. I didn't know, Andrew replied. I was in the army. Well, now you do. He went to the nearest kiosk and bought a newspaper. At home, he read the job listings and had to admit that his chances of finding a decent job were slim. Where they paid a relatively decent salary, computer skills and at least vocational education were required. But Andrew needed something to live on, so he was willing to take any job, even the dirtiest. In the end, he managed to get a job as a laborer at the market. Everything was fine until Andrew got involved with a dubious company. They started coming to his house, and Mr. Andrew began to abuse alcohol. And on one far from perfect day, he became a victim of black realtors. It was fortunate that he survived, although from time to time he thought it might have been better if they had finished him off. But what kind of life awaited him? And the chances of getting out of this hell were extremely slim. For a while, Andrew lived in a shed, still at the market, but then the administration banned it. This isn't a shelter, the director said. Andrew began to wander. He slept wherever he could, ate whatever he could get. Occasionally, he worked part-time in the canteen. The guy helped unload groceries, and in return, he was fed a hot lunch. The most favorable living environment, of course, were the country cottages in the cold season. The main thing was not to get caught by the neighbors. Once, Andrew was terrified beyond measure. He fell asleep sweetly on a soft bed on the second floor. And suddenly, through sleep, he heard a rustle and jumped up. Beads of cold sweat ran down his back, and it was a horrible feeling. They had delivered coal to the owners of the cottage. No one entered the house. Mr. Andrew went unnoticed that time, but who knows what could happen next time. And he decided it was better to quit squatting before they mistook him for a thief and swept him away. Although, if you think about it, in his situation, a state prison wouldn't be the worst option. After all, there would be food and shelter. Except Andrew wasn't a criminal, unless you counted trespassing. So, it was, you could say, not a crime, but a matter of survival. Once, Mr. Andrew was walking in the forest and stumbled upon an abandoned cabin. Well, why not, he thought, not a bad place to live. Andrew continued to work as a laborer at the market, and over time, he managed to somewhat furnish his humble abode. A compassionate vendor of household goods gave him a portable gas stove, so now he could have hot meals and somehow wash up. Near the forest were mountains. Andrew often watched climbers. And a little over a year ago, he made a terrible discovery, the body of a dying young man who fell from a high cliff. Andrew knew that in such cases, you shouldn't touch the person. So, I'm going to get help to the country cottage, he said. Ah, uh, the guy moaned. No need. What do you mean, no need? They'll take you to the hospital, and they'll help you there. Hold on a little longer. They won't help. I'm dying. 
Buddy, can you give a letter to the girl? What letter? Mr. Andrew asked. In the pocket of my jacket. There's Christina's address, my fiancé, I love her very much. Tell her. The guy lost consciousness, but it seemed he was still alive. Andrew, as if hypnotized, reached into the pocket of the young climber's jacket, and the letter was indeed there. He felt sorry for this guy. But maybe, after all, he could be saved? The tramp thought. Well, who knows what he said. When it hurts so much, you involuntarily say you're dying. And he ran towards the village. The road along the cliffs was good, well-trodden, so the car could easily reach the scene. Mr. Andrew ran without looking, and he didn't notice the huge SUV. And then it was pitch dark. He woke up in the hospital. Well, thank God. Maria, the nurse, sighed with relief when she saw the patient open his eyes. How long have I been lying here? Mr. Andrew asked, realizing from the nurse's tone that his unconscious state had lasted definitely more than 15 minutes. Well, a few months, Maria replied. A few months, he exclaimed incredulously. And am I going to live? The doctor said your progress is good, and your body is young, so you'll make it, she smiled. That's good, Andrew breathed out. He no longer wanted to die. Now he understood why God had made him linger on this sinful earth. He had to deliver the letter to the unknown girl. It seemed her name was Christina. And where are my things? Andrew suddenly asked. Where are they? Why are you so worried, the nurse wondered. Your things are in the storeroom. All safe and sound. But you didn't have any documents with you. Where do you live, anyway? In the mountains. In the mountains? Yes, I'm homeless. Maria sighed heavily. She knew very well how doctors treated vagrants. Listen, conspiratorially, she said, when the attending physician asks you about your documents, just say you lost them. You know, they flew out when you got hit by the car, okay? Okay. Mr. Andrew spent another month in the hospital. His body was slowly but surely recovering, and that couldn't but make him happy. Occasionally, Andrew would go out into the hospital yard, sit on a bench, and ponder about how to live on. It seemed his coma had shaken up his whole consciousness, and now one thing was clear, it was time to quit vagrancy. He knew quite a few tramps who ended their days right on the street, and he terribly didn't want to repeat their fate. I'm only 22, Andrew thought. Life is just beginning, so it's time to fix everything. But first, I must deliver the letter and the photo at all costs. I wonder, what happened to that guy? And only later did he learn that the climber had died. Mr. Andrew left the hospital and first thing visited the address indicated on the envelope. There was no one at home. And he left. Then Andrew had other things to worry about. After all, he needed to somehow sort out his own life, not get involved in someone else's. He got a job at the boiler room nearby the registrar's office. When Andrew mentioned the housing problem to the boss, the guy brought him to a small but cozy house not far from the boiler room. Manage it, no fuss, but I think it'll do for now. Of course, it will, Mr. Andrew rejoiced. All this time, the letter with the photo of the guy who, you could say, died in his arms, and the girl were with him. Andrew wouldn't even think of reading someone else's message, but why not take a look at the picture? In the photo, the deceased and a pretty unfamiliar girl with dark blonde hair and gray eyes framed by lush semicircular eyelashes were looking cheerfully, unaware that their happiness would soon come to an end. One day, Andrew accidentally overheard a conversation between two women at the market. Have you heard? Christina, the librarian, is getting married to Bennett. Bennett, Bennett, the other repeated thoughtfully. Is he the hotel owner? That's him. And not so long ago, her fiancé disappeared, the woman said disapprovingly. Oh, these modern girls. Today in love, tomorrow forgotten. Andrew's heart raced anxiously. Christina, it was about her, the ladies were saying. That's the charm of living in a small town. But in this case, they were helpful to Andrew. That's right, the woman agreed. 
And when is the wedding? This Saturday, can you imagine? Oh my. Well, no shame, no conscience. Mentally thanking fate for sending him these gossiping old ladies, Mr. Andrew bought some food and headed home. Everything seemed to be falling into place perfectly. He moved to the city, got a job, and now nothing was stopping him from fulfilling the late man's last wish. And the boiler room where he worked was near the registrar's office. Seems like someone up there finally remembered him. When Mr. Andrew saw Christina hand in hand with the rich man, he felt uneasy. Then anger took over. Unbelievable. Andrew thought. The guy loved her so much, and she traded him for this fat cat. However, what happened next made the stoker change his opinion about the bride. When Mr. Andrew approached the house where Christina lived, his heart pounded furiously. Why? He didn't know himself, but the fact remained. The door was opened by a woman in her forties. Hello? Andrew greeted politely. I'm looking for Christina. And who are you? I'm a good friend of her deceased fiancé, he replied. Oh, I don't know if, the woman replied with a sigh. Kristen. Mom, everything is fine, the daughter, who appeared behind her, said. I'm fine already. Come in, maybe some tea? I won't refuse, Mr. Andrew replied. Actually, I'm not quite Thomas's acquaintance, he confessed, and then told Christina everything as it was, and finally handed her the letter and photo. Thomas always carried this picture with him, the girl said quietly, and her voice trembled traitorously. And when she read the letter, she cried bitterly. You know, Mr. Andrew, I even envy you a little, she smiled through tears. You envy me? Why? Well, because you were the last one to see Thomas alive, Christina explained. How I wish I could be in your place. No, you wouldn't want to be in my place, the guest smiled sadly. Just like in mine, Christina sighed and unexpectedly for herself told the barely familiar man how it happened that she had to agree to marry a rich man. Now I think fate sent you to me, she smiled. Whenever I think of a life with Nicholas, I feel sick. However, Bennett thought, seeing the stoker entering the entrance of the house where the one who never became his wife lived. Without wasting time, the businessman called his henchmen and gave them the go-ahead to teach this idiot a lesson. Hey, man, wanna smoke? A man appeared out of nowhere and asked Andrew. I do, he nodded, taking out a pack from his pocket, and didn't even realize how he ended up on the snow-covered lawn. And a second later, three men mercilessly beat Andrew with their feet. Maybe we should finish him off with a brick, one of them suggested. I personally don't feel like doing it, another objected. Let the horses do it. Who's gonna find him here late at night? Plus, he might catch a cold. Mr. Andrew cast one last glance at the starry sky, and then everything went dark. It seems it was already there, he thought before shutting down. Mrs. Sarah loved taking evening walks, so walking the dog named Jack wasn't burdensome for her. The dog ran around the area, and the elderly woman enjoyed breathing in the fresh frosty air. When Jack had enough fun, Mrs. Sarah picked up the leash, and they headed home. Oh my goodness, exclaimed the old lady upon seeing the guy lying on the ground. Who did this to you? She sat down next to Andrew, and it was indeed him. After making sure the young man was alive, she ran home for the sled. The elderly woman placed Andrew on the sled and dragged him home. Oh dear, she lamented. He's so young. Mrs. Sarah examined the victim and found severe frostbite. And sepsis isn't far off, she whispered quietly. Mr. Andrew was in good hands. Before retiring, she worked as a janitor at the city hospital, but anyone who knew her well was convinced that Mrs. Sarah could have been an excellent doctor. She completed several medical courses, but a conflict with an overly affectionate anatomy professor deprived Sarah of the opportunity to obtain a medical degree and become a doctor. The nasty professor deliberately failed her at exams, and then offered a retake, as he put it, in a relaxed atmosphere. Sarah angrily rejected the offer and, without hesitation, took back her documents. You fool, Sarah, a fellow student told her later. But who and what did you prove? You could have made such a career. But Sarah just shrugged. 
what's meant to be will be. She got a job as a janitor, but the doctors at the Fifth City Hospital respected her, and some even called her a colleague. The patient had a high fever. He delirious, tossing and turning, but Mrs. Sarah was confident she could get him back on his feet. She had her own methods of treatment that had helped more than one person. Where am I? Mr. Andrew weakly asked, staring at the unfamiliar elderly woman. You're with me, Mrs. Sarah involuntarily smiled. Do you remember what happened to you? I remember being asked for a cigarette, and then I was attacked, he recalled. Mr. Andrew tried to move his leg, but to his horror, he couldn't. It's okay, it's okay, guessing his train of thought, the elderly woman reassured him. Legs take a long time to heal, so it feels like this. Do you need to call home? No one to call, he sighed. I grew up in an orphanage, but I probably need to go to work. Stay with me, Mrs. Sarah offered. I'm a bit lonely, and you need to recover, so let's help each other. Well, that makes sense, Andrew smiled. A few days later, the guy began to feel his legs. You're just a magician, he exclaimed. I'm no magician, the embarrassed hostess, once aspiring doctor, waved her hand. You're just a great doctor, he reassured her. Meanwhile, Christina persistently tried to find Andrew. This simple guy touched her in some way. But how? She herself didn't understand. Anyway, she really wanted to find him and talk. Just talk. Christina remembered how after talking to him, she felt amazingly light. Was it because she needed Andrew's company? Possibly. The girl went to the boiler room, but the owner said that Mr. Andrew wasn't at work and showed her where he lived. But Andrew wasn't home. Christina literally felt in her skin that something had happened to him. She returned to the boiler room. Would you mind calling me if you find out anything, she asked the manager, whose name was Mr. Damien. No problem, he assured her. Write down the phone number. And a couple of days later, Christina received a call from the manager, who said that Andrew had been attacked and was staying with some old lady. It was already late, so the visit was decided to be postponed until the next day, especially since it fell on a day off. Christina was about to leave the house when Nicholas came to her. Did you need something? she asked indifferently. Exactly, he calmly replied. I wanted and still want to marry you. But I don't want that, she retorted. You know, Nicholas, I think what happened at the wedding is a sign. What kind of sign? Nicholas exclaimed. I only know one thing. You embarrassed me in front of business partners, and... And now you're trying to fix the situation, Christina suggested. Well, you won't be able to persuade me to marry you anymore. And what made you change your mind, he asked. Don't start with signs, I won't believe it anyway. It's up to you, she shrugged. But I couldn't help but remember Thomas, who loved me until his last breath. And what did I do? I betrayed him. So forgive me, nothing will work out between us. What about the money for your father's treatment? The clumsy suitor grasped for one last argument, like a drowning man clutching at a straw. Bennett, you're just unbelievable, she shook her head. That's who you are. You never thought about why you weren't liked in school? Try to figure it out in your spare time, maybe you'll come up with something. I'd rather look for money for my father's surgery on my own than live with you. Well, well, good luck. Nicholas snapped and angrily stormed out of his ex fiancee's apartment. He got into his car and angrily pounded the steering wheel. What a fool! Bennett shouted. As Christina rightly noted, he wasn't liked in school, and the further it went, the stronger it became. He was arrogant, conceited, and unprincipled. Nicholas had been in love with Christina since sixth grade, but she ignored him. And when she started dating Thomas, he realized he didn't stand a chance at all. After all, Thomas was the life of the party, and he was an outcast. And Nicholas vowed that one day he would get revenge. And he did. Organizing a commercial expedition and finding the people who sabotaged Thomas's safety rope was a piece of cake. In the end, it turned out as it did. Nicholas's associates had already informed him that Christina seemed to be looking for that same tramp. 
Well, let her look, the businessman thought with a nervous smirk, confident that Mr. Andrew was quietly resting in the morgue or even in a communal grave. Whoever seeks, shall find. Meanwhile, Andrew was slowly but surely recovering and started going out with a cane. One evening, he gladly accompanied Senorita Sarah and Jack. Great dog, he remarked. Smart. Did you train him? I don't know, the elderly owner replied. I found him on the street. He doesn't look like a stray, he said thoughtfully. The collar's nice. Although anything can happen. The dog gets annoying, and the owners throw it out on the street. I've seen plenty of them around town. That's true, Mrs. Sarah said sadly. Jack ran up to Andrew and started wagging his tail, as if inviting him to play. And when they finally headed home, the guy noticed barely noticeable numbers on the dog's worn collar. It's a phone number, Mr. Andrew said, pointing above the number in small font. Indeed, Mrs. Sarah replied, and I didn't notice anything blindly. Mr. Andrew decided to call this number, if only to reassure the owners, if they needed the dog, of course. The grandmother didn't mind, but it would be sad for her to part with Jack, who had become her family. A few years ago, she had been left completely alone. Mrs. Sarah's husband died of a heart attack, and her wayward son, who never left prison, disappeared somewhere in the northern colonies. So the elderly woman would prefer the dog to be astray. However, nothing like that happened. According to Andrew, the owner was very happy and assured him that there would be a reward. But what reward? Mrs. Sarah shook her head sadly. The dog's owner, who turned out to be named Commander, arrived half an hour later. And he was stunned to see the exact copy of himself in Mr. Andrew. The dog's owner, whose name was Albert, was also shocked. He had certainly heard about everyone supposedly having a doppelganger, but frankly, he didn't really believe in it. How is that possible? Albert exclaimed, staring at Andrew with wide eyes. Suddenly, both of them felt like they were looking into a mirror. The only plausible explanation was that the guys were twin brothers. So what, Albert thought, did their parents leave Andrew at the hospital? He refused to believe it. For him, mom and dad were role models in everything, but facts were stubborn things. Before Albert stood his own reflection, and what was he supposed to think? Yes, son, you indeed have a twin brother, his mother confessed to him. But nobody left him at the hospital. And Albert's parents told him that his brother was kidnapped. It was the doing of a midwife who worked for his father's business rivals. We found her, his father said. But that scoundrel never confessed where she took the child. We tried to find him, sighed Mrs. Elaine. But unfortunately, we didn't want to tell you about it. We tried to forget ourselves, although, God knows, it's very difficult. And now it turns out that Sebastian is alive. Andrew corrected Albert with a smile. And for us, he's Sebastian, Mr. Stevens said sadly. Am I the son of a wealthy businessman? Mr. Andrew exclaimed. Well, well. Yes, Albert replied with a smile. And he's waiting for you for dinner on Saturday evening, little brother. But the surprises didn't end there, fortunately, they were pleasant. The doorbell rang, and there stood Christina on the doorstep. Mrs. Sarah wanted Andrew to stay with her for a little while. Although, I suppose you have other plans now, she said sadly. Why would the son of a wealthy businessman need a lonely old aunt? Mr. Andrew even took offense. If it weren't for you, I'd be on the other side by now, he said. And Christina, who was there at the moment, thought that one deceased was enough for her. After getting to know Andrew better, she realized that she seemed to be falling in love again. For her, Andrew became a model of honesty and justice. Not to love such a guy would be a real crime. Take this letter story, for example. Why on earth did he need some Christina and her message? He could have just thrown it away and been done with it. Especially since he had his own problems at the time. But, it seems, the lady named Fate brought them together in this way. I'll definitely stay with you, Mr. Andrew said. You cook such delicious borscht and pancakes. Oh, what a flatterer you are. Flatterer, or not, I really don't want to lose touch with you. 
Really? Of course, he said with a smile and hugged Senorita Sara. Andrew indeed had many plans. After all, he was about to get an education, and he had already enrolled in preparatory courses. He decided to become an engineer. His twin brother, Albert, worked in administration, and he had some connections in the healthcare system. Thanks to this, he helped the bride of his found brother to cure her father. It's just some kind of miracle. Agatha rejoiced. And Albert also gave Mrs. Sarah a puppy of the same breed as the one she found, Commodore. Loneliness with this lively little one was definitely not threatening her. Finding out that the father of his runaway fiancé was now in good health, Nicholas was completely discouraged. Frankly, deep down, he hoped that Christina would crawl to him on her knees and beg him to marry her. All right, I'll agree, but on my own terms, the scheming businessman dreamed. But everything turned out completely differently from what Nicholas imagined in his rosy dreams. It turned out that the stoker not only survived but also turned out to be the son of Senor Roberto, who owned a network of gas stations and a car dealership. Who would have thought? At that moment, Nicholas fully realized the meaning of the saying, you can't force love. Well, I love her, you know, I love her, he explained to a random drinking buddy at the bar. That's what women want, huh? If you're not her person, then you mean nothing, philosophically remarked the man with the face of a drunken intellectual. I was ready to lay the whole world at her feet, you know, boasted the businessman. But she doesn't need your world, the bottle guy retorted with a smirk. We'll see about that, said Nicholas. And, grabbing the car keys from the table, he rushed out of the bar. She doesn't need the world, muttered the considerably drunk businessman. His Mercedes swerved, narrowly avoiding a collision with an SUV whose driver gave Nicholas an expressive look and twirled his finger by his temple. You're nuts, he muttered and, stepping on the gas, headed towards the city exit. There he collided with a truck. Is he alive? Nicholas heard a male voice as if through cotton wool. He's alive all right, another man replied. But the question is, can we save him? I beg you, please save him. Nicholas wanted to shout, but for some reason, he couldn't. I'm cool. I'm cool, he said deliriously. Cool, cool, the paramedic said wearily. Who will need you and your coolness if you can't even walk? In the hospital, Nicholas kept repeating how cool he was in his delirium. Do you even know who I am? I'm a real mobster. I managed to get rid of a guy, then organized an assassination. In short, I've got it all under control. The nurses exchanged glances. One of them pulled out her smartphone and quickly turned on the voice recorder. Why do you need to know that? asked her colleague. He's delirious. You never know what someone might say in this state. Yes, anything, but usually, it's true, the girl replied and turned to Nicholas. Who did you get rid of? What assassination? First, I got rid of my fiancé's husband, then I arranged an assassination attempt on a vagrant. Nicholas's tongue stumbled, but overall, he spoke relatively coherently. My guys took care of him properly, but he, the parasite, survived. It seems like this is no delirium, the skeptical nurse said slowly. Yeah, people have been talking about it in the city for a long time, whispered her partner. Consciousness returned to Nicholas, and suddenly he felt unbearably cold. And when the businessman emerged from the anesthesia and slowly opened his eyes, he saw two policemen next to him. Awake, one of the officers asked cheerfully. Huh? Still not fully grasping what was happening, Nicholas nodded. Well, good, the policeman summed up. Every word of yours has been recorded, so as soon as you're fit, we're moving you straight to prison. You have no right, he protested. Are you taking advantage of my condition? I demand a lawyer. Everything will be provided, promised the second officer. A lawyer and everything else you're entitled to. But it's unlikely to help you much. Murder with attempted murder is no joke. A wedding is always beautiful and exciting. And this time, thank God, it really was. You're lucky, Kristinka. Veronica sighed. One can only dream of such a handsome guy, and from such a family too. 
Is that happiness, laughed the happy bride this time? Oh, come on, Veronica, your turn will come. Don't forget to catch the bride's bouquet. Deal. In addition to relatives and friends, those people who extended a helping hand to Andrew when he needed it were not forgotten. Mr. Damien and Mrs. Sarah. The latter, upon receiving the invitation, simply burst into tears. Oh, thank you for not forgetting Grandma, she said. When the newlyweds left the registry office, the guests began to shower them with rice and rose petals. Bitter, they chanted, and the newlyweds didn't keep themselves waiting long. If only Andrew and Christina could, they would have kissed for eternity. The wedding celebration ended, and it was time for everyday life. Christina no longer worked at the library, now she was a senior specialist in administration. Andrew studied at the Polytechnic Institute to become a mechanical engineer and worked remotely as a sales manager at his father-in-law's car dealership. He finally mastered the computer and now felt like a genius. Christina was proud of him with all her heart. Not everyone, oh, not everyone can get out of the swamp they stupidly stumbled into after the army. But it all depends on the first, most difficult step. And Andrew took it. Not only for himself, but also for his beloved wife and the future family, which, as it turned out shortly after the wedding, was about to grow. Oh, the prodigal son returns with interest. Mr. Roberto laughed upon hearing the news. Not only did he find himself, but also a bride and a future heir. The family is growing. Great. Too bad I won't live long enough to see ten grandchildren from Albert. Who knows, maybe following my brother's example, fate will turn its attention to me, the son parried, glancing at the pretty witness who caught the bride's bouquet.